One of the real issues in British politics at the moment is migration. Mm -hmm. It's out of control. The small boats keep on coming. The only thing that ever seems to stop them is the weather. Mm -hmm. You managed to stop illegal migration into Australia when you were Prime Minister. What's the secret? Do the lessons you learned apply in the UK, or are we very different? Well, Jacob, first of all, uh, British people should understand that these sceptred isles are a magnet. Uh, who wouldn't want to live in Britain if they could, particularly if currently they're living in some busted-ass country uh, in, in Africa or the Middle East? So Britain is a magnet. But if Britain is to continue to be uh, the country that it is, uh, with the peace and order that it has, it does have to control its borders. Uh, now, we had a problem on a somewhat different scale, perhaps, but nevertheless a very serious problem uh, under the former Labor government in Australia. We had 50,000 people come illegally by boat in that government's term. Uh, in the worst month, July of 2013, we had 5,000 come in a single month illegally by boat from Java. Uh, what the Abbott government did was uh, restore the Howard government's policies with a couple of important additions. Um, temporary protection visas rather than permanent residency for people who made it to the Australian mainland. Uh, offshore processing in places like Nauru and Papua New Guinea rather than uh, on mainland Australia for those who were picked up at sea. And turning boats around where it was safe to do so. Now in John Howard's time these policies worked to stop the boats. What the people smugglers started to do in the Rudd-Gillard years was scuttle their boats. So our Navy and Coast Guard uh, were forced to pick people up and take them to Christmas Island, where eventually most of them got to Australia uh, and, and got caught up in the legal system and eventually uh, stayed. What my government did was uh, when the boats were scuttled, we would put them on a mothership, uh, we'd put the, the would-be illegal migrants onto a mothership, and then at an appropriate time, we would put them in a big, on orange, unsinkable life raft with just enough fuel uh, to get uh, the 12 miles from the international boundary uh, to the beaches of Java. And uh, I can remember seeing on the front page of our newspaper in early 2014, a big orange life raft washed up on the beach of Java. It was the whole front page photo. And I thought, we've won this because the message will go out loud and clear to the people smugglers and their clients. The way is closed. Now, uh, it's a lot easier to get from Calais uh, to Dover in a rubber ducky than it is to, to cross the 300 miles of open sea between Java and Christmas Island. So there are more boats more frequently. And France is not Indonesia uh, when it comes to perhaps uh, landing people back on the shores of France. But where there's a will, there's a way. And the will, frankly, is what's been lacking. There has been insufficient will on the part of the British government and on the part of the British apparatus generally to send people back. And one of the things that I think Britain could well consider uh, as a prelude to perhaps more vigorous action in the English Channel uh, is more vigorous action by the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean to land boat people back on the shores of Libya and the other ungoverned or scarcely governed spaces from which they're originally coming. That would show the French and the Italians goodwill, uh, and I think it would give Britain, um, if you like, more of a, of a moral upper hand uh, in insisting uh, that boat people apprehended in the Channel uh, are going back to France. And, and you mentioned French and Italian interests, and obviously we've now left the European Union. Mm -hmm. Brexit's been very important. And that's allowing us greater freedom in our foreign policy, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed in our trade policy. You were instrumental in leading to the AUKUS deal, an important deal in terms of security between the UK, the US and Australia. Um, is there more we can do because this all contributes to global security? Absolutely it does. And I was so, so 
enthused by the AUKUS uh, uh, deal, which renews the great alliance between the major English-speaking countries, uh, so important for the security of the wider world and critical in uh, locking Britain into the security of the Far East as well as uh, Europe and the Middle East. So, so, so good on Boris Johnson uh, for doing it, along with Joe Biden and Scott Morrison, and good on their successes for, for continuing it. Um, one thing that has happened, which I don't think you Britons appreciate enough, is Britain's accession to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, this is the world's best uh, uh, plurilateral, uh, multilateral uh, free trade deal. Uh, unlike the EU, uh, it has no pretensions to merge into, to, for, for countries to lose their sovereignty in some kind of supranational uh, confederation. But it's a very, very important uh, arrangement. Uh, Britain is now the second largest economy in the TPP. Britain will obviously bring a lot of uh, good sense to TPP discussions, such as whether to admit Taiwan. Uh, and whether to continue to exclude a communist China. And I think Britain's presence uh, might over time encourage the United States to rethink its involvement in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, so, so despite a, a lot of domestic difficulties, uh, quite a lot of good foreign policy and trade policy things have been happening under the current Conservative government. And um, we should, um, I think, give credit where it's due and appreciate our strengths, as well as uh, acknowledge our failures and resolve to do better. And it opens up more free trade mm -hmm. um, through the um, CTPPP. Um, and we've got a free trade deal with Australia, mm -hmm. which the EU, I notice, has stopped negotiations on. And that Australia's um, history of free trade agreements is it does much more for your economy than people forecast. That it becomes a real driver for economic e e growth. Exactly right, because it's not just about removing the obvious impediments. It's putting out the welcome mat. Uh, and th these are important psychological and cultural uh, improvements. Uh, the mood music changes completely. Uh, and, and that's why trade deals in the end are about so much more than trade. And this is why uh, it's so important that uh, there be a swift conclusion to the uh, Britain-India uh, trade mm -hmm. talks because uh, quite apart from the fact that almost nothing would better put up in lights uh, global Britain's success than a deal with India, which is the world's emerging democratic superpower. But it would also, uh, I think, uh, remind the Indians that they have far mu much more in common with countries like Britain, Australia and the United States than they do with their rival on the other side of the Himalayas. Or indeed with Russia. Indeed. I think India is going to be the most important foreign relationship for the UK over the next century. But that, I think, we will have to discuss the next time I you come, um, when no doubt we'll all be fuelled by hormone beef or not. Because <laughs> I think that's excluded from the free trade deal and, to, to and reassure enough, my farmers. And fair enough, if, if, if British consumers are worried about um, certain additives, make them illegal, and regardless of the free trade deal, um, it will continue to be illegal. Well, it doesn't seem to have done you any harm. But Tony Abbott, thank you very much for joining me uh, this evening. Thanks, Jacob.